Uh, I can tell you that I decided to change the sermon today after several of you came to me with expressions, concerns, and congratulations uh, about the word prayer. To which I say, finally, where y'all been? I know prayer is a provocative word, that's why I use it. And I welcome you coming to me. It starts a wonderful conversation. And we're not going to end that conversation today, although I get to have a microphone for 20 minutes. This conversation is going to be ongoing. We'll process through it over, over years. Uh, this is the spiritual journey that we are on together. After all, prayer is one of those words, one of those uh, tripwire words, <laughs> that some of us Unitarian Universalists have a difficult time embracing. And I still have a reaction to the word. I find it challenging, unsettling, and sometimes off-putting. I find that the mind can become hardened around such words, and this kind of precludes some possibilities. I bet some of you may have come here today after reading what this was about with your boxing gloves on. <laughs> but this is not a fight. This is an exploration. So rest easy. I invite you to consider the possibility that prayer is not so dismaying, not so dishonest, and not so fantastical as some of our experiences and subsequent evaluations have given us to think. And I hope today to begin the redemption of this word prayer for those who currently despise it, and perhaps to put a new spin on it for those who currently make it a practice. So the two most frequent protests to prayer in a Unitarian Universalist setting tend to be, broadly speaking, one, a complaint against an objectionable theology. And of course, the concomitant experiences of past and present associated with the practitioners of that theology. And two, there is a doubt as to the purpose and effectiveness of the act. So these questions about the definition and purpose of prayer are bound together. We will try and tease them out and evaluate them for a moment. Definition. Okay, I, I would consider prayer to be a kind of conversational meditation with an emphasis on the conversational. <coughs> Its purpose is to facilitate our focus while highlighting that our reality is one of relationships. That how we come to be is through relationship. That we do not exist in a vacuum and that our attitude toward these relationships are better when they're cooperative than when they're dictatorial. And this, of course, leads us to the theological associations of prayer. But I tell you that we need not consider our prayer dedicated to an addressee or in the name of some esteemed character to be meaningful. Now, I acknowledge that such addresses and dedications, when filled with honesty, are powerful invocations. Indeed, any prayer filled with honesty is powerful. Which begs the question, powerful in what way? Okay, so let's talk about what prayer does. And I confess, sometimes it feels hollow. And sometimes it looks self-serving. Like when I see a group of other folks all praying together and it just looks really corny <laughs> and like like a group self-deception and therefore both goofy and frightening and that's exactly how it looked to me my first few weeks at seminary I went to Austin Presbyterian 
Theological Seminary. Seemed like my new classmates there, those well-intentioned Christian souls, prayed at the beginning of everything. <laughs> every class, every meal, every test, every school function, bathroom breaks. <laughs> everything. The truth is that, that, that my impression was probably conjured up by my mind, estranged as it was from the practice of prayer. And, and that foreignness made it seem more rampant than it really was. But they did pray frequently. And they often prayed to open a class, that's true. And these were led by students frequently. And they were called upon, volunteer style or sneak attack style. <coughs> Who shall lead us in prayer today? At which point I started praying like hell, but they would not call on me. <laughs> <laughs> and that prayer worked. <laughs> of course, they never wanted to give the UU a <laughs> At that time, I was dismayed and fearfully put off by the regularity and even mundane object of most of the praying. So keep in mind, I was attending a Christian school as a Unitarian Universalist who particularly back then bought into the atheist-theist divide, falling firmly on the side of a kind of atheism. And these were people praying to Holy God, or sometimes Mother God, or the Fountain of Life, or sometimes, rather infamously, to someone named Father Weegis. As in, Father, we just asked that you open our hearts <laughs> and rest assured that got schooled out of them. <laughs> for me, I, I thought the whole thing patently for the birds. So how did I get from the point where, for the pastoral, uh, from there, to the point where for the pastoral prayer I simply suggest, let's pray. And I don't use any of the usual Unitarian Universalist clauses and dissimulations such as, please assume an attitude of prayer or prayer or mindful consideration or meditative repose or at least please endure this next prayerish part <laughs> with patience and the most manageable expression of smug discontent. <laughs> How did I get from my classmates, our wackadoo prayer junkies, to the unmitigated Let's pray. What made prayer compelling? So I guess with regards to prayer in those first days of seminary, you would have considered me a cultured despiser, right? Someone who, who thought about it, even had some education on it, and had rejected practice. I imagine that there are some equally cultured despisers among us today. I want you to know that I hear you, and I understand. And the turn of phrase, culture despiser, is brought to us by one of the West's great theologians, Friedrich Schleiermacher. And he delivered a treatise called On Religion, Speeches to Its Cultured Despisers. And it remains a seminal work addressed to a world that even then, in the 1700s, was turning away from intentional religion as a world-ordering enterprise. And his thoughts fit easily into you, you thought today. In fact, the American transcendentalist movement, which has influenced so strongly the Unitarian aspect of our tradition, drew heavily from Schleiermacher. And in a nutshell, he proposed that religion was a feeling rather than an act of intellect or will. Religiousness was not necessarily intellectually sensible, but was in essence emotionally and psychologically sensual, a feeling. I think prayer is a doorway into that feeling. It's not the only doorway. Meditation works, ritual works, songs work. Saying hello in the right way might even work. 
all of these things have potential to open the door into that feeling. That feeling that enlarges us and ensures us that harmony, the sensation that all is perfectly as it is and interdependently so, is real. But to have harmony, there must be more than one note. And this is why I like prayer. Indeed, more than one note is the fundamental assumption that prayer makes and I think is how prayer works. It is also what separates prayer from meditation and ritual. Now, much like meditation and ritual, prayer orders the world. And by that I mean that these practices establish focus. For we are what we focus on. And that is the dynamic that I witnessed at seminary again and again, where a crowd of excited or sleepy or distracted learners were all quickly and peaceably attuned to one another, to the teacher, and to the subject of the class. Most importantly, to our larger purpose. This was done by the act of prayer. And so ritual and meditation may also do this. They also may invoke the sensation of harmony, but I maintain that there is a difference. And the most significant difference is, as I've mentioned, that prayer directly implies more than one note. As to that note, earlier I said that prayer need not be addressed to any deity or name or even quality. I do not believe that leaving out the dear God or Holy Earth, or Father Weegis, or Light of Life, compromises the power of prayer. Nor does it compromise the conversational aspect of the act. In other words, I don't think it matters whether or not you address your prayer to something or someone. What matters is that in honest prayer, you are automatically reaching beyond yourself. For in the dialogue of honest prayer, in the reaching out, is the acknowledgement that there is more going on here than just you. And that what happens in life is not all up to you alone. This does not imply that it is up to deity, unless you want it to. It does not imply that it is up to deity just that you aren't deity. What a relief. <laughs> you know? I mean, one of the first sensations that I get when I know that I'm praying effectively is a sensation of relief. It's a sensation of releasing the burden and this is traced to the first step of prayer. This unconscious recognition that I am not entirely in charge. It is a letting go. And in that way, it's a kind of self-forgiveness. Now you may say that if no one needs to be out there being prayed at, if we do not need an addressee, then outward is really inward. And this is all sort of a roundabout and possibly delusional way to do meditation. And there, there is a truth to that. And there's always the danger of self-delusion. And that applies to any activity. And the truth is that at some point, outward becomes inward, and vice versa. Or rather, the distinction drops out. After all, we are what we focus on. But prayer does something unique. Prayer puts relationship at the center. <coughs> because relationship is a two-way street, that means that we depend significantly on something outside of us to make us us. And so in prayer, in the heart of it, is an acceptance of our vulnerability. And that is so important. 
Prayer is a moment of vulnerability. And it is through that vulnerability that one may ironically find a kind of strength. Because you're dealing now with a feeling that enlarges and assures you that harmony is real and that there is hope and healing and happiness and forgiveness. So I propose that the thing that distinguishes prayer, it's, it's characteristic, is its characteristic of dialogue. It's characteristic of acknowledging and calling us to some life beyond our sense of self, which carries with it a sense of vulnerability, relief, and assurance. A conversational orientation is basic to prayer. So it would probably be a good thing to keep in mind that if prayer is conversational, then a fair bit of it involves just keeping quiet and listening. Again, not necessarily to a God, but perhaps to an ineffable, unnameable parts and some of those parts whose confluence is the great flow and rhythm of your life and life in general. Or perhaps to an imagined spirit guide that embodies the best of all of that. To this you may pray, which means to this we must also Listen. So there's a good story about Mother Teresa, where a reporter asked her, what do you say when you pray? I listen, she said. And after pausing a moment, the reporter asked, okay, well then what does God say? And she replied, he listens. I find that beautiful and compelling. So not only is prayer reaching out beyond yourself and hope, it is an openness oriented beyond the self and into the relationships that conspire to create your reality. It is asking. It is shouting. It is singing. It's dancing. It is service. And it is listening. So an important caveat to the summary, summary that I'm about to present. This is more of a tendency than a guarantee. It is almost a skill, and it definitely takes practice. But because prayer is spiritually oriented conversation, it highlights our interdependence and thus releases us from the burden of total control, invites a vulnerability through which we gain strength via the perfection of that very interconnectedness. So over the Christmas holidays, we were up at my folks' house in the mountains of Arizona and we got a big snow uh, one evening. And Katie and I and the girls live in an, or live, stay when we're there in a little apartment on top of the garage. And so we have to walk down the stairs and then over to the, to the house. And uh, the girls like to wake up early. <laughs> so it was still very much uh, dawn, very much dusky dawn. And uh, because of the recent snow, the trees were all flocked with snow, and there's a hill here, and it was kind of glowing white in the, in the dawn. And I walked outside, and I was carrying Cora at the time, and she had just learned what Christmas trees were, and she likes them. And I said, Cora, what do you see? And she said, snow! I said, that's right. So what else do you see? And she said, Christmas trees! <laughs> and I said, that's right. And then she just kept on looking out at the hill with the snow and the trees on it. And then she said, thank you. <laughs> and then she said, more. <laughs> and she wasn't thanking or asking me. I mean, I was there. I was a part of that. I was holding her. But she wasn't looking at me. She was looking out at the, at the light 
and the trees and the snow. She was thanking the temperature. All the qualities that made that moment. And these are far too diverse and complex for her to name or for me to name. But that's what I pray to. It wasn't God. She has no concept of God. So she wasn't asking God for more. But that was a prayer. It was an expression of gratitude and yearning. And that is what I invite you to when I suggest Let's pray.